So, it's a great honor to introduce Wolfgang Spohn. Uh, and uh, pleasure also to touch upon a topic um, relating to that connects social sciences and also philosophy. Uh, in social sciences, our interest is often go beyond where we have, uh, shall we say, measures and metrics. Uh, when you have some interaction among uh, agents in a game, for example, when you have make conjectures about the future and so on and so forth, um, ranking theory, <coughs> which uh, Spawn has developed, and is a uh, uh, basically a, a leading proponent of uh, of these approaches uh, relating to. Uh, going beyond, shall we say, probability distributions, metrics, and so on and so forth, and nevertheless being able to derive uh, statements that are useful also for us in the social sciences. So I'm here stressing, shall we say, the applied, um, <coughs> the, applied uh, the application of, of uh, Spoon's work and, and uh, related works. Of course, it's even more interesting to get, shall we say, the pure form. Okay. And uh, with these words, uh, I welcome you and uh, looking very much forward to, to, to your lecture. Thank you uh, very today. much for the introduction. Uh, it's my first time in Odense here and therefore I'm really grateful for the invitation. I hope to bring along nice weather, but it was not nice in Iceland when I left, so how can it be nice here when I come here? I hope everybody of you has got the handout, I mean, and it's just the slides which I'm going to present, but so you have, to, you have something to take away with uh, if you want to. Uh, so I hope I have I had sufficient many copies. Okay. Uh, um, so the whole idea was Timos in the beginning, he, he thought I, I should present my stuff here at this occasion, and I was somewhat unsure about the audience I need. Because, uh, it, it was clear to me that you are not philosophers, or, or uh, only few perhaps, uh, um, uh, but from all kinds of sciences. Uh, but then I also thought, uh, well, you all have a mathematical background, more or less, uh, so that will be a little bit important. I will, will introduce formal stuff, only basic stuff, but still it's formal. But then I thought, well, that's something you would understand, because mathematics, in a way, is the universal language of all the sciences. And so I hope, uh, I hope to, 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 uh, to hit the right level with my talk. Uh, but I'm not completely sure. Then Timo has also asked me to give a kind of tutorial afterwards, in the afternoon, after lunch. Uh, um, so everybody is invited to also to attend to that tutorial of ranking theory. Um, and then I thought, well, the other way around would have been better, first the tutorial and then the talk. Uh, uh, but now it's this way around. Um, so this talk will be also simply a kind of advertisement of ranking theory. Yeah? So, so the, in a way, the, the introduction into ranking theory itself will be quite brief. Uh, and then I want to display what you can do with ranking theory. Yeah? Uh, so as I said, it's also a kind of advertisement. Uh, so that, that's the table of contents. Uh, uh, we need not go through all the chapters, so to speak. Yeah? We, we, we stop when, when time is over, then we stop, and we can stop. I, mean, I want to get till here. And I think we can stop after that or after that. And definitely, probably, we don't uh, reach the last section. Anyway, so <coughs> as an introduction, um, uh, but it's not a talk about social sciences. In a way, it's a talk really about pure epistemology. Yeah? We are, uh, uh, I want to explain to you what epistemology is about. Um, and perhaps uh, but a good uh, entrance, into the ex uh, uh, entrance into the topic is th that one clear it makes clear to oneself once more that strange mutual inclusion of epistemology and the empirical sciences. On the one hand, you can think, oh, epistemology is one tiny part of the sciences. Yeah? It's about how, how our cognition works. Uh, uh, and then there are many things in the world which work somehow, and science uh, investigates how they work. So cognition is one of these many parts of the world, on the one hand. On the other hand, it's also the other way around. Uh, 
Epistemology is a very general theory of what we are doing in all the sciences. Huh? We are all applied epistemologists when we are doing science. And then we want to know about the general principles about which guide our exploration in whatever field we really require. So in a way, epistemology is also a very general theory for all the sciences. Indeed, it is about what we are rationally doing in the sciences. So it is about abstract epistemological principles or models and about, and about their justification why we ought to follow them. So that makes clear also again that it's a normative theory. It's not about how cognition actually works. It's about how it should work. Uh, um, uh, so, <clears throat> and then of course we want to be precise in these things. Huh? We want to have a precise construction. If you do a peer to theorizing, then we get all kinds of problems and when it's particularly precise. But about the norms, about the normative aspects of epistemology, it's much easier to be precise, and when, when we can do it, we should do it. And that means that we engage in formal epistemology, using formal methods to do epistemology. <coughs> OK. So <coughs> what <coughs> could be the tasks of epistemological models which we want to build? Here are four abstract desiderata. First, such a model should capture the rational structure of epistemic states at any given time. Oh, no, that's the static part. So I think of electrostatics. What's the distribution of uh, electric charge in a body? Yeah? So that's the electrostatics. And likewise, what is the epistemic state at any given time? Now, epistemic states change due to many causes, but often due to rational reasons. So such a model should capture the rational change of, the rational change of epistemic states. That's the dynamic part. You know, like electrostatics, that becomes interesting when we turn to electrodynamics. <clears throat> Such a model should account also for the fact that our beliefs are uncertain and come in degrees. Yeah? I mean, that's a fundamental observation. Yeah? Our beliefs are less, more firm or less firm. Yeah? Uh, they are more certain or less certain, and so on. There are many, many, many words for that. They come in degrees. In the meantime, there are many models of uncertainty, and that's very interesting to study. But certainly, probability theory is by far the leading paradigm since 300 years. I mean, it was the first. And that there are alternative conceptions of uncertainty, that's only a very recent discovery. And so uh, the advance of probability theory is about 250 years. And of course, therefore, it's far ahead of all other models. However, all the time, we also talk of believing something, of taking something to be true. Not just to be probable, but to be true. That's how we talk. Yeah? We take something to be true without specification of any degrees. And then we may either neglect this phenomenon, that we also talk of belief simplicity, as many do, or we may take it seriously, as more and more do in the meantime, fortunately. And this raises the issue of the relation between graded belief and ungraded belief. We seem to talk of both. And the question is, what is the relation? <coughs> Ranking theory is an epistemological theory that satisfies all four desiderata. That's its intention. It's a static and a dynamic theory of belief, simplicity, or acceptance. That's an alternative word for the same thing. And this is a big advantage over probability theory, which is unable to represent the uh, Sorry, and that's, yeah, can I ask you a question? What is yeah. the definition of true? Huh? I mean, what is actually the definition true? of truth? Yeah, I mean, oh. in, in the case of the first I mean, we are really starting philosophy now. No, 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 no I, I no. just want to say, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get into that, but you know, it's, uh, it is a mathematical prove a truth? I mean, and what actually is the... the no, uh, I'm, I'm just using the notion of truth informally. Yeah? And then, of course, we can have the semantic theory of Tarski. Yeah? The snow is white is true if and only if snow is white. And then we can build a big theory upon that. Yeah? But it, it's just so that, so yeah? you truth is an it's objective state. It's a correspondence theory of truth. So yeah. it's a truth is a, it's an objective statement that doesn't depend on who is going to look at it. Correct? No, I mean, yeah, yeah, uh, that, that's the idea. Truth ah, is something okay. objective. Right? Very good. Uh, but but belief in truth is, of course, not objective. That's subjective. Beliefs are beliefs. Um, yeah. Truth is truth. But, <laughs> I mean, uh, but my emphasis is on taking to be true. 
Fine. That's unqualified by degrees. So, I, so I, far, I, yeah, that's the point. I just um, want you to understand, I mean, what yeah. was the base, uh, yeah. baseline? And of course, I mean, it's really a big, big topic. Yeah? Um, but we may be satisfied with the correspondence. I'm happy. Okay. Um, uh, now, uh, that's something, the first point, is something I could explain for a while. Why, why isn't probability theory unable to represent belief? Yeah? Uh, but uh, just accept it as a, uh, as a claim. Uh, uh, I, I could argue for that one. So, uh, the point is, uh, ranking theory is a static theory of belief. That's the first thing. Uh, but the dynamics of belief can only be stated by also introducing degrees of belief, as we shall see. So it is at the same time a theory of degrees of belief and explains the relation belief, between belief and degrees of belief. And now, um, if one looks at things more closely, one finds that the dynamics and the degrees of belief are closely related to inductive inference and to diffusive reasoning, also abductive inference, all these things. So we, 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 we apply in the sciences all these kinds of reasoning. So ranking theory delivers also an account of all these latter things. And then these are, in the end, the important applications, as we shall see a little bit later on. So as I say here, these basic features have widely ramifying consequences as I'm going to explain. So let us first see what the theory really is. And here's the definition of the theory. Uh, so first, we have to assume that we are talking about uh, some subject matter, which we can describe the describe the sentences. Uh, or as in a different uh, terminology, if there are various possibilities described by language. We consider only a, a limited space of possibilities. Uh, and we call that um, the possibility space, or it's the sample space in probabilistic terms, or what have you. Uh, or a set of possible words, as we philosophers say, but that's also confusing with the, the talk of possible words. So we have a possibility space of, uh, let's say, finitely many, exclusive possibilities, but altogether exhaustive possibilities. So exactly one of the possibilities must be the true one. Right? And then we have the, the script A to be a complete algebra of propositions. So uh, each set of possible words, so each subset of W is a proposition. That is a truth condition, which is true exactly uh, if and only if the true or the actual world lies in the proposition, is a member of the proposition. Anyway, so that's what you also also use for probability theory. You can always think of probability theory. I'm doing, in a way, just the same. And then I say, what's the N? That doesn't mean anything. Uh, kappa is a negative ranking function, as I used to say. For that algebra of propositions, if kappa is a function from the algebra into the natural numbers extended by infinity, such that the following two axioms hold and just introducing the mathematical structure. The, the sure proposition W gets ranked zero. The impossible proposition, the empty set, gets ranked infinite. And then we have the crucial law of disjunction. A disjunction, the rank of a disjunction is just the minimum of the rank of the disjuncts. <coughs> and this entails that either A or non-A or both must get rank zero. That's what I call the law of negation. So A and B are elements of because W. Because you are A or non-A, that's equal to W, the sure proposition. And that has zero. That means one of these two. Sorry, A, A and B are two propositions in W. Pardon? A and B are two propositions in W. Uh, are two yeah, are sure. elements of W. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm getting the max straight. So, Due to this law, the ranking function is determined by its values from the singleton propositions or worlds. And then the, uh, the rank of a proposition is just the minimum of the ranks of the worlds in the proposition. OK, and then uh, the A means that at least one world must get rank zero. Otherwise, the sure proposition could have not the minimum at zero. OK, uh, so that's already the entire theory. <laughs> we don't learn more in a way. Right? That's the basic theory. And, uh, recall of probability theory. Yeah? You just have the three actions, and then you uh, develop entire libraries out of these three actions. 
and probability theory. What's the interpretation? That's the important thing. Yeah? Uh, and then one understands that definition. Yeah? So ranking functions are gradients of this thing. So you have to think in, in double negation, so to speak. And that's something uh, 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 a bit difficult. Yeah? But uh, uh, one, one, once one is aware of the fact, then, then it's simple to manage, I think. So that means if kappa of A is larger than zero, that is, means that A is disbelieved or taken to be false. Yeah, you think then you think A is false to some degree. Yeah? Kappa of A equals to zero says that A is not disbelieved and perhaps believed, but that's not guaranteed. It may also be that kappa of A is zero and kappa of non-A is also zero. And that means you neither believe A nor disbelieve A. Uh, and that means you suspend judgment concerning A. That's, of course, something very usual. Yeah? Uh, I ask you, uh, 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 what's, the, what's the weather uh, the day after tomorrow? And then you say, I don't know. I have no idea. Yeah? So you have no beliefs, no positive, no negative beliefs about the weather the day after tomorrow. Uh, that's suspense of judgment. And so finally, that means that if non-A is the kappa of the rank of non-A is larger than zero, that means non-A is believed or taken to be false. And reversely, that means that A is believed or taken to be true. Yeah, so that's the explication of belief within the theory. So that's the interpretation. Uh, so can I? And then you can find, uh, it's easy to see that the axioms entail that belief understood in this way is consistent and deductively close. And these are the two basic rationality assumptions which you find throughout epistemic logic. Yeah? What is belief? It must be consistent. Inconsistent belief is irrational. And it must be deductively close. If you believe, uh, if you believe A uh, and then think A is true, then a deductive consequence of A must be true according to logic. And that is, if you think A is true, you must also think that the consequence is true. So that's deductive closure. And then you, uh, yeah. So, sorry to repeat yeah, 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 it's okay. Uh, you know, when, when people have like this, uh, I mean, I forgot now the name, but this famous theorem that says that any axiomatic uh, definition of mathematics contains always a uh, an energy shape that cannot be proved, like uh, the uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. is that consistent with kappa of equal to zero and not kappa of yeah, equal to zero? Is that well, the that's, a, that's the standard objection yeah. against this rationality question is that, that um, uh, belief should be deductively closed, and then people say, oh, but a uh, deductive, uh, deductive consequence is not decidable. Right. That, that's exactly the result you are referring to. And so, uh, uh, I don't, uh, yeah. oh, thank you yeah, for the order. Uh, but if it's decidable, how can you ask for doing it, uh, knowing it all the time? But first of all, I mean, that, that, that refers to, to, to not to propositional logic, which is the only one which is assumed here, uh, but only to first order logic, uh, and then and, and upwards, uh, or more, more richer logic than first order logic. But can I just uh, say that okay, you... Uh, and then your third, your third uh, ranking condition, k of a equal to zero and not k of a equal to zero, can be basically exactly this case, where I can, you know, I can prove either it's true or yeah, not yeah. true. Yeah. But uh, as I said, it's, it's only on the propositional level, yeah, where we have propositional logic, and then that there, okay, so, so we can have a long, again a long argument no. about that. Uh, uh, another point is that. Uh, um, but you have the same problem with probability. Oh, it's simply mathematics. You have it everywhere. It's, 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 yeah. it's, so, it's not your problem. It's a general so, yeah, problem yeah, yeah. of uh, so, mathematics. Um, right? um, um, OK. One might also define a positive ranking function, which I call beta. And that's simply, I mean, if non-A is disbelieved, then A is believed. So beta expresses ranks of positive belief. And one can also define two-sided ranking functions in this way. Uh, which expresses belief and disbelief at once. That is, if tau of A is larger than zero, then A is believed. If it's smaller than zero, A is disbelieved. And if it's equal to zero, you have suspensive judgment. So it might, this may sound to be the most intuitive function. Uh, but mathematically, as I say here, the neg these negative ranking functions, which I have defined first, 
are the theoretically most fruitful version, and we will see why that is the case. Uh, uh, and that may also be the reason why people have not discovered that before, yeah? because they were always thinking in these other terms, and then you cannot, it's difficult to develop, to come up with a theory, and, and I, I will explain to you. Uh, uh, you can develop it only in these terms, uh, which may at first seem unnatural, but once you develop the theory, you see that it's natural. Okay, so that's, that's the basic interpretation. And now the crucial thing of the whole theory is, I mean, the theory has predecessors, uh, as I'm mentioning here, but the crucial thing is that you can also define conditional ranks and conditional belief. You do not only believe things, propositions, uh, uh, that is taken to be true, but you also take some propositions to be true under certain assumptions. Eh? Given A, I believe, blah, blah, blah. Given it's nice weather tomorrow, it will be also nice weather the day after tomorrow. I don't know whether it's nice weather tomorrow, but given that, it will be nice weather the day after tomorrow. That's perhaps what I believe. <coughs> um, so we have conditional beliefs. And that means also we need to have conditional ranks, yeah, if the ranks are to express belief and disbelief. And that's my definition. Yeah. The, <coughs> um, uh, the rank of B given A is just the rank of A and B minus the rank of A. And as I say, this definition is the crucial advance of ranking theory over its predecessors. You may know, know the name of Shackle, uh, George Shackle, who has uh, a long time ago developed a, a, a theory of the functions of potential surprise. And that was in, already in the, the, the origins go back to the 19, 1939, I think. Uh, and then he has a nice book in 1961 where he developed the theory. But it's all very tentative and it's not very clear. When you look at the functions, they look exactly the same as these ranking functions. Uh, but he does not have the, uh, or not exactly the same, but roughly the same. I mean, the law of disjunction, that's something he has as well. Uh, and the law of negation. But he does not have that definition of conditional ranks. He has a different one and then he can't develop a good theory. And likewise, uh, I mean, um, another key word is, is Cohen's Baconian probability. He has also developed a kind of theory. But as I said, none of the predecessors had that definition. And that's the crucial thing. <coughs> In other words, that means the definition of conditional ranks is equivalent to what I call the law of conjunction. What's your disbelief in A and B? And there I say, well, that's the disbelief in A plus the disbelief in B given A. And that's quite intuitive. Yeah? What is your degree of disbelief in A and B? Well, one way for A and B to be fast is that A is fast. So that's its first the degree of disbelief in A. Yeah? But So this contributes kappa of A to that degree. However, given A is true, B must be fast in order for A and B to be fast. So, and this adds the degree of belief in B, given a, a disbelief in B, given A. And just an aside, we might as well axiomatize ranking theory by this definition uh, of conditional ranks and what I call the conditional law of negation. Uh, that kappa B of given A is zero or kappa of non-B given A is zero. And that simply means uh, conditional consistency. Yeah? Given A, you cannot both disbelieve B and non-B, or believe, positively believe B and non-B. Yeah? Then you would, then as given A, you must not believe a contradiction. So the only assumption built in into the theory is uh, that definition of conditional ranks and that conditional consistency. Not only actually you must be consistent, but given any condition, you must not be inconsistent as well. <coughs> uh, and then like in probability theory, you can go on defining, but I, I'm not pursuing that now, a conditional dependence and independence of propositions. So that is the epistemic dependence and independence, but if you recall probability theory, their independence and dependence are crucial notions again, which I can copy here as well. <coughs> So, uh, and with the conditional ranks, as you can imagine, I can all, I'm able to state a dynamics of ranking functions and thus also a dynamics of belief. <coughs> so, uh, 
So how do ranking functions learn? That is, how are they updated by new information? Well, information usually does not come with an absolute certainty, but only with some firmness. And yeah, so it makes a difference uh, whether you read something in the yellow press or whether you read something in the serious paper, or when you uh, get the information from the original informant. Yeah? Uh, so these are three different ways to get the same information, but in three different degrees of certainty. So uh, we have that firmness parameter. Yeah? And then, uh, well, we know it need not go into the details of that formula. The idea is simply that if you receive information A with firmness N, then the ranks of N improve by N, and the, of, uh, of A improve by, uh, by N, and the uh, ranks of non-A uh, go down. Yeah? So the, the, the parts of A and non-A, they shift relative to each other just by exactly N ranks. That's the firmness of the parameter. And the further idea is that you keep fixed the conditional ranks given A and given non-A. Uh, as I, as I describe it here a little bit. Uh, so as I said, we, we need not start with the formula. That what's interesting about is now we can state a complete rule of how to change our ranking function. And that means also how to change leaves. And you couldn't do, and the point, the further point is, which I want to explain in the tutorial a bit more extensively, is you couldn't do it with simpler means. Yeah? Uh, you, need, you need to have these degrees, these ranks, in order to be able to state such a rule. Uh, Sorry, can I, so this, this and just, uh, That rule is the ranking analog to a version of probabilistic conditionalization, which is uh, generalized. Jeffrey conditionalization, as it is called, and it may be generalized to more complex informational input consisting of some arbitrary ranking function on some arbitrary subalgebra. The important point, perhaps, for you, because you also had Peter Janfors here giving a talk, this rule also comprises a special cases, the expansions, revisions, and contractions, the three doxastic changes dealt with in belief revision theory. However, <coughs> And that's the point. Revisions and contractions are not iterable and hence do not provide a complete dynamics of belief. Yeah? Uh, and you, you, only, you do not want only to be able to de describe one change, one step of change, but a complete dynamics uh, must uh, describe its arbitrary many changes. So. Uh, the point is, you can apply that rule. You know, first, you learn about A. Next time, you learn about A prime. Uh, next time, you learn about A double prime, and so on. And you can always apply this rule. Whereas the, the belief chain theory of belief volition theory explains only one step and doesn't know how to deal with the second step. Uh, so, and that was uh, that's why I came to think of ranking theory. Yeah? because I observed this uh, deficiency of uh, belief revision theory and thought about it, what can we do? And then I came up with ranking theory. That was a long time ago, 35 years ago, when I was thinking about these things for the first time. Uh, and therefore, ranking theory offers a complete dynamics of belief. <coughs> um, the question, of course, was where do the numbers come from? Yeah? I mean, I'm supposing, so to speak, uh, a, 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 a mental state which is measured by numbers. Uh, how are they arbitrary, the numbers? Where do they come from? <coughs> uh, and for that reason, uh, later on, I've come up with a measurement theory <coughs> for the ranks. Um, they can be measured. Think of, uh, um, uh, think of utility theory, which is perhaps the more familiar example, yeah? where do the utilities come from, the numbers? Yeah? And then people have theorems, oh, you certainly have preferences, and you are, when your preferences uh, are such and such, then your utility numbers are determined by your preferences uniquely. That is not really uniquely, but up to an interval scale. Yeah? Uh, they are determined on an interval scale. Uh, and then, okay, and that explains the numbers in utility theory. And likewise here, uh, <coughs> but the measurement theory works in a different way. It's here in the red sentence. The, the point is, if you are it, a, a belief contraction, what is a belief contraction? They are simply ask you uh, to give up your belief. Yeah? Maybe, 
you believe that it will rain tomorrow? Now, believe, now I ask you, no, no, that's not true. Uh, uh, maybe it's not raining tomorrow. Yeah? Uh, I, I don't promise you that it won't rain tomorrow, but it's, it's not clear whether it will rain. So then I ask you to give up your belief that it will be raining tomorrow. Yeah? without uh, not substituting it by another belief, or just to give up your old belief. That's a belief contraction. <coughs> and, then, <coughs> and then I can ask you to do th 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 these two times. Huh? First, please contract your belief in A. Yeah? OK, now we have done so. And then I ask you, well, now please also uh, contract your belief and give up your belief in B as well. Yeah? And then you will believe still less. Yeah? OK. And that has to satisfy certain laws. And if it does satisfy certain laws, these iterated contractions, twofold iterated contractions, determine your ranking function uniquely up to a constant factor. Yeah? But that's a, a, quite, uh, that's a complicated theorem. Yeah? Uh, it's quite involved, but it, it holds. Um, <coughs> and it explains where the numbers come from. Yeah? Your contraction behavior determines those figures. Yeah? Um, <coughs> Ask a question. And it, but it means that belief is only measured on a ratio scale. Yeah? That's a funny thing. And that uh, you all have, uh, you, you, you are aware of the problem of interpersonal comparison of utility. So how do I compare your utilities and mine? Uh, that's difficult. What's your unit and what's your zero? Uh, and my unit, my zero. And likewise with belief. Yeah? Uh, and that's a problem which has not been fathomed at all so far. Yeah? Uh, that was uh, yeah, I'm just sorry. wondering when I'm listening to this, how does this relate to weight of evidence? Who? Weight of evidence. Uh, yeah, yeah, the weight of evidence. <coughs> um, uh, do you mean that parameter? Uh, I mean in general. Can I say, uh, or this one, that N? I mean in general. Can I say, uh, um, Sort of the, the, that's, the theory developed by Turing and that's a complicated question. Let's say uh, I mean, the, the, there are various theories about the weights of evidence. But one thing is the, the depth schafer theory, which uh, claims to identify the weight of evidence directly. Yeah? And then the Bayesians in probability theory, they say, well, uh, we have another, th I mean, we have, don't have the weight of evidence, uh, but uh, we can express this in a different way. And I would prefer that answer in, in this, this respect to ranking theory as well. So uh, um, you may have little evidence about the die, yeah? and then you have the equal distribution of 1, 6 for all the results of the die without evidence whatsoever, let's say. Yeah? And then you, then you have a lot of evidence that really are quite certain that the die is fair. Again, you have the same distribution. Yeah? And then uh, now the critics say, oh, uh, but that must be two different epistemic states. In the first case, you have no idea about the die. And it's a, it's a the principle of uh, insufficient reason that, that you apply for the uh, equal distribution. And the, in the other case, you have a lot of information. It's a lot of weight of evidence. And still arrive at the same thing. So where's the distinction? And the basin say the distinction is, oh, uh, once you have learned very much, uh, it's very hard to change that. Yeah? Whereas when you have learned nothing, then you may easily learn that the, the, the die is unfair. Yeah? And then you have a different distribution. So, uh, it, uh, and, and, that, uh, and you can uh, represent that difference in probabilistic terms. Yeah? That would be the basic answer to the weight of evidence uh, problem, and I would uh, have the same answer here. Uh, <coughs> um, Sorry, can I? So you were, uh, also, you were yeah. also mentioning utility theory, right? I mean, uh, yeah. uh, David Kahneman. Kahneman uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, he actually is, makes a point that utility theory is as a problem associated with the fact that it doesn't really know the baseline. In other words, if I'm very, very rich for me, and my utility is different than for somebody which is equal to much, much poorer than me in terms of what is my perception of utility. Yeah, yeah. Would that apply here too? In terms yeah, of belief? That's a, uh, I mean, his criticism is a different one. I mean, he says uh, you don't really form expected utility, so, or, um, but really uh, your way is a different one from, from taking the mathematical right. expectation. That is, you either overestimate or underestimate uh, the small probabilities and such things. And, but then uh, the standard theory doesn't apply. Uh, 
So far, it's, uh, that theory is just a theory from the rational point of view. Right. How it applies psychologically, uh, that would be a matter of empirical okay. investigation. And uh, at the moment, it's just starting to get uh, applied in psychological, in cognitive psychology. Yeah? But the, the results are still very, very sparse. And then, it, but it, then it would still be an open question: Well, how does the theory of rationality, the normative theory of rationality, relate to the empirical findings? And would, can the empirical findings somehow refute the normative theory? Uh, that's a very complicated so Sorry, from a mathematical standpoint, your W, your set, is a, it's an algebra, it's a group, or what it is? No, it's, the, the W and the, the A is the algebra. In algebra, in algebra. Yeah. okay. okay. But that's a, a standard Boolean algebra. Okay, and I wouldn't know how, and I haven't thought about it. For, uh, Extending it to different kinds of algebra. Okay. So is it mean, infinite algebra? In, in probability theory, you also, I mean, you have the standard thing about normal Boolean algebra, but then in physics you also have uh, different kinds of algebra. Yes. And, and no, but but that, that's, I haven't thought about that. But, uh, so uh, perhaps I should explain that because that's important. So you may have recognized that already. There's an obvious pervasive analogy between probability and ranking theory. Simply replace the sum of probabilities by the minimum. Think of the law of destruction. Yeah? That's the uh, additivity principle in probabilistic terms, uh, which is the basic axioms of probability theory. I replace the sum of probabilities by the minimum of ranks, and the product and quotient of probabilities by the sum and the difference of ranks. Think of my definition of conditional ranks and, 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 and compare that with the definition of conditional probabilities. Huh? That's precisely that replacement of product and quotient of probabilities by the sum and difference of ranks. And thereby, each probabilistic theorem is almost guaranteed to turn into a ranking theorem. Huh? So now you have that huge development of, of probability theory, and you can translate almost all of that into ranking theory. Yeah? And I've done that I mean, in my, my thick book. Yeah? Uh, I've done that to a very far extent. Yeah? Uh, uh, so why does that work? I mean, the reason is that one might formally understand ranks as all of magnitudes of probabilities. That is, logarithms of, and now it becomes a bit complicated, of non-standard probabilities relative to infinitesimal phase. Only then you can translate the minimum, uh, the, the, the sum of probabilities into the minimum of ranks. Uh, but rather only the standard part, and that entails some subtle but important difference. But uh, <coughs> um, well, these are mathematical details. Uh, but uh, basically, that's the explanation why that translation works. Uh, but I would like to, <coughs> yeah. This has far-reaching consequences. Mathematically, you can copy large parts of probability theory. And what I'm going to explain, is if I have time, in the rest of the talk is uh, doing some parts of that. Yeah? Philosophically, it means you can transform many virtues of Basinism, which acquire a new significance due to the interpretation of ranking theory as a theory of belief. <coughs> and for the same reason, you may find new virtues. Yeah? This might suggest that ranking theory is nothing but an extension of the Bayesian point of view. No? So it's the same, isn't it? Uh, however, I think this would be a misunderstanding because Bayesianism simply has no notion of belief, yeah? of taking to the truth. And perhaps just the, the, look at the following basic alternative. You might say, um, what is belief in probability theory? Yeah? That's just probability one. Yeah? Uh, uh, okay, uh, and then you have the same properties uh, as uh, in ranking theory. But we call first uh, 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 note that you cannot change probability one. Yeah? Uh, so what, what, uh, once you a thing has probability one, it will keep probability one all the time. However, you change your probabilities. Yeah? Uh, so you cannot change beliefs in that account of belief. Yeah? So that's bad, and it, phenomenally, it's. Uh, it's inadequate. Yeah? Uh, if you if you have probability one for a thing, you can bet your life on that. Yeah? Uh, yeah? Nothing happens. Yeah? So um, you offer me a bet. I give you thousand. If I if I win, I get thousand dollars. If I lose, you may kill me. 
And if I'm absolutely at probability one that I will win, then I can accept the offer. Yeah? But that's not what you do with your usual beliefs. Right? There are many beliefs, but they are still uncertain. Yeah? So the other idea is to say, OK, so belief is just probability, say, 0.9 now, 0.95. Yeah? Uh, that's vague, uh, whatever it is, sometimes threshold. Yeah? But then the fundamental fact is A can be have a higher probability than 0.9, B can have higher probability than 0.9, but A and B can have probability lower than 0.9. Yeah, that's, you can find many examples. Yeah? And if you take long conjunctions, that will happen. Yeah? I mean, if A1 to A100 have all probability higher than 0.9, the conjunction A1 and, 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 and A100 will have probability below 0.9, or very small probability even. Uh, so, and that, and, and that contradicts uh, deductive closure of beliefs. Uh, if you believe A and believe B, of course you believe, if you think A is true and B is true, of course you think that A and B is true as well. Uh, that's pure logic, isn't it? Uh, so, uh, so in that account, probability theory cannot account for the deductive closure. Now some people say, oh, that's a good reason to give up deductive closure. Mm -hmm. And others say, no, that's the reason why probability theory cannot uh, uh, account for belief. <coughs> and I say, I want to add that ranking theory is a theory of belief, and that is an important advantage over Bayesianism. Now you have to tell me when I have to stop. Uh, um, <coughs> uh, yeah, so there's a rich literature on that lottery paradox that I've just explained, and on the relation between belief and probability. Nothing is really satisfactory. I conclude belief and probability are like oil and water. They don't mix easily. Their coexistence and their relation are profound and disturbing issues, which become all the more pressing once we have an equally elaborated theory of belief. If you just have a pure notion of belief and a, a fully developed theory of probability, then you can say, okay, the rich theory is the nice thing. But I feel if rich theory is on both sides, then you cannot have that attitude anymore. Uh, so I think ranking theory should be seen as an independent theory despite its formal similarities. And in the following, if I have time, I shall briefly sketch some applications of ranking theory in philosophy of science only. Uh, though there are many other uh, applications as well. Perhaps uh, a nice thing, uh, and uh, there's time for that, Bayes' theorem for ranks. Uh, all of you know Bayes' theorem and probability theory and how it's fundamental for uh, scientific inference. Uh, uh, now we have exactly the same setup here. Let A1 to AN be N pairwise and disjoint, jointly exhaustive propositions or hypotheses and be some other proposition, the evidence. Uh, in this setting, we may understand kappa of AK as the prior rank or implausibility of the hypothesis AK. Kappa B, given AK as the rank or the unexpectedness, the likelihood of the evidence given the hypothesis AK. And then, uh, and then K of AK, the kappa of AK given B as the posterior rank or implausibility of AK, the posterior, yeah? after evidence B has been collected. Uh, and then we have the simple theorem that the posterior uh, assessment of the hypothesis is just that unexpectedness of the evidence given the uh, hypothesis and the prior uh, implausibility of the hypothesis minus a normalizing factor that this one. Yeah? And that's very much looks like Bayes' theorem, the probability theory, and that's how it looks for ranks. Yeah? And where we, we can specify that normalizing factor according to the formula of the total probability or the formula of the total rank. Yeah? Bayes' theorem for ranks roughly says that the posterior implausibility of some hypothesis is just its prior implausibility plus the unexpectedness of the evidence. And then you have the same mechanism as you are used to uh, from Bayes' theorem and probability theory. Yeah? Uh, <coughs> it has often been observed that the original Bayes' theorem appears to be the core of abduction or inference to the best explanation. This has also been contested on various grounds. The basic point in that criticism seems to me that 
uh, the inference of the best explanation is mostly applied to cases displaying no probabilistic nature at all. Yeah? Uh, the one famous thing is always the explanation of the uh, deviation in the, Uran, in, the, in, the, uh, in the trajectory of Uranus uh, due to, to the existence of Neptune. Uh, yeah? And there we have the inference to the best explanation to the existence of Neptune. Uh, but where is probability theory involved? There no probabilistic assessment of hypothesis or whatever. Yeah? So that's why people are also reluctant to say, oh, uh, uh, inference to the best explanation is just Bayes' theorem. So my alternative proposal is that Bayes' theorem for ranks provides the core of inference to the best explanation. And the probabilistic Bayes' theorem is moreover plagued by the problem of the so-called catch-all hypothesis. So, so you may have, oh, you have the hypothesis A1 to A10, yeah? but that's not exhaustive, or uh, and therefore you say you postulate the catch-all hypothesis, or some other hypothesis applies, and then your set of hypotheses is exhaustive. Yeah? But what's the likelihood of uh, given that catch-all hypothesis? No idea. Yeah. Uh, what's the likelihood of the evidence given some other hypothesis applies? Uh, that's undefined. Yeah? On the one hand, it's undefined. On the other hand, it's part of the formula of Bayes' theorem. Yeah? You need to know what the, what the likelihood of the evidence is given the catch-all hypothesis. And that's uh, that's uh, that was a serious problem for the uh, for the patients. Uh, and in my view, it's unsolved. Yeah? It's neglected, so to speak. Yeah? Uh, the ranking version is not plagued by this problem yeah? uh, because uh, the formula of the total rank that was this one that shows that the normalizing factor is not influenced at all by very implausible hypothesis AI. So the catch-all hypothesis, that's the last resort. Yeah? That's the, uh, the last thing we think of, but maybe we get into this situation. We have to take it seriously, but initially we don't take it seriously. That is its rank, its negative rank, is very high yeah? uh, so, or very low, for, uh, uh, let's say. Yeah? And then it doesn't influence that minimum at all. Yeah? So you can really, in the ranking theory, you can forget about the catch-all hypothesis, even though, uh, and it's theoretically OK to do it, though, unlike in the Basin, uh, uh, in the basin case. Yeah? But that's what I call the innocence of the worst explanation. And I find that a nice argument. Um, uh, no, but you do have to tell me when I have to stop. Huh? Uh, yes. Because you want to have uh, questions and uh, maybe have questions. Uh, and I, I, I can, in a way, I can go on forever. Yeah? I, 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 I say the 600 that. pages of my book that will take <laughs> days and weeks. Huh? Uh, okay. Uh, okay uh, so, so, so thanks for that. Yeah. So, so let's uh, round it up in like five minutes and take one or two uh, questions. Okay, yeah. that would be. Uh, okay, so, uh, I mean, I, I should go on for another five minutes, or if no, you, no, if you minutes. wish, or is yeah. this a good point to? That, that might be. Uh, drag it off. The last chapter. That's a more difficult one. That's a okay. very minute. Uh, that's this one. Uh, that, that's perhaps a, a nice slide. I mentioned uh, uh, we have the notion of a conditional rank. Uh, Therefore, we, we have a notion of dependence and independence, and we have also conditional notions of that, conditional dependence and conditional independence. And now we may be familiar with the theory of base nets, which has a big career uh, in the last, well, I mean, the, the, the really big book which uh, initiated the whole thing, that was the book by Pearl in 1988, um, 20, 29 years ago. Uh, um, uh, and that for the first time presented the theory of base nets with graphical methods. Um, although, the, in a way, um, I should I mean, and, and that whole theory is based on the properties of conditional probabilistic independence. Uh, but that's the crucial thing. And then, once you have these laws, then you can develop the whole theory. Uh, but these laws are. Uh, they are, in, in effect, already in my dissertation, yeah? the probabilistic laws. And then I thought about ranking theory or after parallelism. And uh, that means uh, that uh, you can also have the, the same theory of <coughs> in terms of ranking theory. Yeah? 
the ranking nets, so to speak. Yeah? Uh, and so formally, that was the very same. Yeah? So it's not related to statistics. Yeah? That's not so clear, because uh, um, the base nets that they are related to observed relative frequencies. And the question might be, what is the analog in ranking theory? It's certainly not relative frequencies. Um, um, it's still, uh, Concerning the theory, is, it's, it's the very same. What I explained then on the next slides is perhaps just that. That base net theorizing is crucial for causal theorizing. Yeah? I mean, there's always the old problem, what is the relation between causation and correlation? Yeah? And stati statisticians only find correlation. So how can they draw causal conclusions? Yeah? And the theory of base nets is the, the most uh, elaborated answer to that, yeah? how you can draw causal conclusions from correlational data. Uh, uh, and in ranking theory, it's just uh, the same. You have now the corresponding theory of ranking nets. And that gives you not a theory of probabilistic causation, but a theory of deterministic causation, yeah? which is, which is uh, uh, in a way, the, the historically much older topic than probabilistic causation. Yeah? You have probabilistic causation perhaps since 50 years or 100 years, perhaps at most, yeah? whereas uh, deterministic causation from the ancient time, people are thinking about deterministic causation. So what's the theory of that? Yeah? And that's not clear. I mean, there are old theories. Uh, they are all insufficient. There is now the counterfactual theory. And then you have to go into counterfactuals. What's their logic? And my claim is, you can do that better uh, in terms of ranking theory. So it's right, uh, the, but that slide, the previous slide, and this slide suggests at least that you can really do that. Yeah? And that was the other aim why I originally thought of, uh, of uh, ranking theory. Uh, because I observed, I mean, there were sophisticated theories of probabilistic causation in the 70s already, and unsophisticated theories of uh, of uh, deterministic causations. And I was thinking about, oh, how can I raise the, in principle, more important theory of deterministic causation to the same level of sophistication as the probabilistic theories? And that was the other big motive, besides solving the problem of iterated belief revision of my original development of ranking theory. And that's perhaps a good end point of my talk. Yeah? So that was the other uh, big thing. I haven't explained how that works, uh, but that's the, at least the promise that it can do that. OK, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>
But but, but, we, but well, as I read this first, it seems like uh, that if if your own if you take your own reliability to be higher than the reliability of the source, right? Yeah. Your, your own reliability swamps the importance of the source, given this uh, definition of yeah. M. Okay, and. It, and, and, and that's I, my own reliability. That's my my simply my epistemic state, my ranking function. I have a let's say I disbelieve in A. Yeah, I think A is false. Yeah. yeah. And now somebody comes along and informs me and says, tells me no, A is the case. Uh, and then then it's a question of uh, of course then I have to weigh so when my former disbelief with that new information yeah. Yeah, and maybe uh, that information only. Uh, moves me to, to weaken my disbelief, yeah? so, so I don't give up my disbelief. Yeah? I mean, so there, there's some positive information about A, uh, okay, um, but slightly suspicious, so maybe I don't give up my disbelief in A, but still I weaken my disbelief in A. That, that may happen as well. Okay. Yeah? And, and how, how does that figure in the formula? So you meet somebody slightly less yeah, reliable than uh, yourself? Uh, uh, let's say, uh, I have rank 10 for, uh, it, it's sunny tomorrow, yeah? It, it yeah. Really doesn't mean right. So I, I have a strong disbelief that it will be sunny tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, um, now you tell me, like oh, the weather report, <laughs> now you tell me, the weather report says it will be sunny <laughs> tomorrow. Yes. Uh, that's what you tell me. Yeah. And then I stare at you incredulously and sure. then, is, is that really true? But still, uh, if you say so, that at least weakens my disbelief in that it will be sunny tomorrow. Yeah? So that is perhaps it's not 10 anymore, but it's only 5. Yeah, that's how it should be. But how, yeah, how that's, it, that that's how it expresses here. Yeah? Uh, okay. So, uh, so uh, my disbelief, uh, so, so to speak, my belief in A, yeah? or that is my, my, my disbelief in, in, not, uh, in, in A, sorry, my disbelief in A weakens by 5 ranks. And that's precisely here that, that I'm. So, uh, yeah. Um, uh, um, look, if if, uh, if you take A, what, what's your degree of belief in A itself, yeah, and what you get in front of? Take B equals A, yeah. Then it's uh, that's zero, and that's infinite. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Okay, no, we, we should do it on, on paper, yeah? Uh, but uh, I, I can promise you, yeah, we, we should do it on paper, yeah? But then I can, can uh, or, or on the blackboard, then I can explain to you. So that, that's one possible effect, yeah? That I have a strong disbelief in that it will be sunny tomorrow, and after your information, I only have a weak disbelief. Still disbelieve it. I can't believe that it will be nice weather tomorrow, but it's less strong after you have said so, yeah? That it will be nice. Uh -huh. So another question here. Yeah. Yeah. So did I understand correctly that your ranking uh, function gives numbers in the, that are natural and not real? Uh, uh, you can do it also with real numbers. Yeah? Uh, um, um, <coughs> the question is, I mean, uh, in probability theory, you have finite additivity, yeah? and then if, if, in the more advanced probability theory, you have sigma additivity. Yeah? If you have infinite lar infinitely large algebras, yeah? then you are thinking also about these terms, then you have sigma additivity. And likewise, you may think about well, what do, how do you extend that on the infinite case, yeah? but that's not, uh, that now it's getting more involved in a way. And my, uh, I have an argument then that minimativity or, uh, should also apply to infinite disjunctions. Yeah? Yeah. So the, yeah, the, so my the rank of the infinite disjunctions is the minimum of the ranks of the infinitely many disjuncts. Yeah? So not, not the infimum, the minimum. Yeah? That's a difference, yeah? uh, the minimum. And that means every infinite collection of ranks has to have a minimum. Uh, that is, the range of ranks, the ranking functions, is, should be well ordered. Uh, and then the natural numbers are uh, natural choice, and the real numbers 
don't work in an existing way. But uh, don't you have a problem then if you have a set of models that depend, where the only difference is uh, a parameter that has a real value? Yeah. Because then you can't, uh, uh, then your ranking function will not be a continuous function of that parameter. Yeah. And that yeah, I mean, uh, I mean that if you really, uh, I mean, if you accept that law, yeah, uh, and really say you stick to the minimum in the infinite case, and not uh, not to the infimum, yeah, which is weaker, not to the infimum, uh, and then you get problems to to get together the ranking theory with uh, continuum mathematics. Let's say, yeah, that, that that's a that's a, a complicated relation which is not not clear to me, yeah. Uh, uh, and, but I haven't thought it through. I mean, you, can, you might say, well, then we take the infimum instead of the minimum, and then we get a compatibility with the, with the continuum mathematics. But I confess, I haven't thought, uh, I haven't thought about it. Yeah? That then really happens. So, uh, of course, that's, an, that's an, uh, a good question. Right? Uh, yeah. Can I ask uh, a last question? Though? Okay. So, so probability theory deals with the events uh, that are to a large uh, extent uh, objective, let's say, or we can agree on some on the definition of, a, of an yeah. event, but your theory deals with uh, beliefs. So how can we actually communicate I mean, uh, each other about something which is actually very yeah, yeah, subjective? Yeah. Yeah. So That's true. Right? So, so, uh, uh, <sighs> Yeah. And then, then also, I mean, then, 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 let's say the second part of the question is: Does your theory requires, I mean, an, ad, an additional theory of how the system of beliefs are created, for example, or are changed dynamically? I would like to doubt, in a way, the presupposition of your question. I mean, okay, we all have the notion of objective, objective probability. But what we really have there is very unclear. Yeah? What is objective probability? We seem to understand it, but really when we uh, start looking at it more, uh, more intensely, we see we don't really understand it. Yeah? Well, what that really is, uh, we have the notion of, of relative frequency, you know, and that's completely objective. Yeah? Uh, um, <coughs> but how does relative frequency relate to objective probability? That's already a big issue. Yeah? Objective probability is not relative frequency in the limit. Uh, um, because, okay, so, so we can have a long argument about that. Yeah? Well, it's not really clear, but still, we seem to understand that objective probability. I grant that and somehow we, we, we should make sense of that. Yeah? And therefore, the, it's a good question what might be the objective counterpart <coughs> of these ranks. Yeah? Uh, and, uh, and that's uh, really a deep question. Yeah? For instance, uh, um, causation. Uh, I, I explain causal relation to a ranking theory, and that means relative to the epistemic state. Uh, now, and that seems like uh, uh, causation is just in the eye of the beholder. Uh, it's not an objective fact out there, it's in the eye of the beholder. And that sounds crazy. Uh, uh, now, I have good precedent there. Uh, David Hume said the same. Uh, it's in the eye of the beholder. Uh, so, if David Hume says so, I might say so as well. Yeah. Uh, but perhaps David Hume shouldn't have said so. That's <laughs> unclear. So what I try to 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 add uh, is also a theory of objectification. Yeah? So to some extent, I can make sense of the notion of objective ranking functions. Yeah? But that's a complicated thing. It's um, it's only chapter 15 of my big book. And sometimes I get the impression nobody has read up to chapter 15. So, so far, I have, I have really no comments on that. Yeah? I, I would, really would like to know what people think about that objectivization theory. But so far, I don't know. Yeah? But as I said, you, you are right. It, it's a big problem. And I, I should say something about it. And I've tried to say something about it. Whether that's acceptable is not the issue. Yeah? OK, thanks. Thank you so much. And, uh, <laughs> This cannot be eaten. No. And but this can be no. Oh no, no, it's a T-shirt. Oh. Uh, oh. 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 That's very good. When I lecture now in Constance, I should wear this T-shirt for well, advertisement of the Dia. Of course. <laughs> okay. Of course. Nothing goes for free. Our belief in the Dia.